Hey everyone, welcome to Grow Benzie's Farmer's Market. My name is Josh Stoltz. This is our last market of the season, so I want to thank you for joining us today. I'm joined here by Lisa Richter, our farm market manager, and Bill Palladino, the CEO of Taste the Local Difference. We've got a great show today, a lot of different things we're going to show you around the property. This has been a unique season for us. Last year for the farmer's market, we had M115 under construction. We had a hard time getting anybody in the driveway, let alone come to the market. So it's nice to have an open road, have people hanging out with us, and the classes and everything that we started this year is also new. Uh, Lisa, being our market manager, has done a great job of promoting but also organizing all these ideas that everybody throws our way. Lisa, what are some of the things that we've added this year compared to the years in the past? Well, we've had every week on every Monday, there's been a fun class. So we've had kombucha, fermented tea. Tonight we'll have hops 101 or tomato canning. So people can learn different things about healthy eating. And that's in addition to then the fun cooking demos that have happened for free at 4 and 530 every Monday this whole year. And so also with that, we always have music going, the food trucks serving their food, and people enjoying conversation and hanging out with their community. So it's been a fun year. Yeah, and the other thing that we have here at Girl Benzie in terms of programs, we have a, a bee guild, we have a fiber guild, we have a compost guild, so we've had a lot of beekeeping classes. Uh, we have our fiber guild, so there's the, the sewers and the knitters, so it's real nice for us to be able to reach out to one of those uh, guild members and say, hey, you want to come in and do a workshop or do a presentation? And that's had quite the turnout, too. Tell us about the, the food assistance programs that we offer. We're honored to be able to support and offer pretty much any food assistance program that's offered in our region. So one awesome one is the Double Up Food Bucks program where SNAP Bridge Card users can come and double the money that they put on their card for fresh fruits and vegetables that are grown here. Also we have WIC Project Fresh coupon distributions that happen right on site here so that participants don't even have to travel to the farmer's market to use those coupons. We accept the Senior Project Fresh and we also have partnered with the Northwest Michigan health services for for some fruit and vegetable support work that they're doing and then super excited about the fruit and vegetable prescription program that's happening with our partners at Munson that's bringing in a lot of folks for cooking demos and more support for fresh fruits and vegetables which we'll be talking about a little bit later on so on the other side of Lisa is Bill Palladino. Bill's an old friend of mine who has been part of the food scene since I moved back here. Uh, he's, his name is associated with, with entrepreneurship and things that are really happening in terms of innovation and connecting people to food. And his big, the big project, obviously, is the CEO of it, is Taste the Local Difference. Now, when I first moved back here, this was just a map. And now they've got a, a full feature publication in magazine. And now you're in the southeast. Benzie section. There's the Benzie section. Bill, how did this come, you know, starting from an idea to being a magazine that's distributed to tens of thousands of people? Sure, Taste the Local Difference started the ideas of some farmers and food people who said we need a way to connect farmers with consumers. And it started with five counties uh, around Traverse City area. Benzie was one of those and quickly spread to 10 counties. And we were serving 10 counties in Northwest Michigan for about 12 years. And then I came along and we expanded that program. So now we're representing about 49 counties around Michigan. So we just crossed the halfway point. We're trying to get statewide by the end of next year. But our main goal is to help sell more local food, locally grown and produced food. And we have two objects. One is to differentiate local food to make sure people understand when they're standing at a counter. They know which of the food is local and which of the food is from the mystery places. And then we, once people understand it's local, our job is to teach them why it's more important to buy local, even if sometimes that food is more expensive, which sometimes it can be. Well, one thing I've learned growing here at Grow Benzie, I have been growing, um, is the value of food is, is changing in my mindset. So years ago, I'd look for the dollar hamburger and think I've got a value meal, especially if I can get a dollar french fry and a dollar pop to go with that. But now, after I've been eating that food, I, I recognize how much it does not, you know, it's not good for me. But also, I recognize the, the energy that goes into making that food. So if I go to the food, if I go to the food truck at Grill Benzie and I get a sandwich that has a tomato that's grown from the garden 100 feet away, I know all the effort that that farmer put into that tomato versus the tomato that was grown in, say, South America and then frozen when it was green and then shipped across. 
the ocean and then shows up in the freezer. And, you know, I'm just recognizing the value of the energy of the farmers that put into the food and then how that shows up in my belly and, you know, up here. But, you know, you guys do promote farmers markets in, in addition to restaurants that, that use local food. What's the scene on the farmers markets here over the last couple of years? So in Michigan, there are about 150 approximately farmers markets uh, that we can name. Some of them are small, some of them are in hospitals. Um, in Benzie County, I think there are five or six that we have. This is probably the biggest one we have here. Um, farmers markets are really important because they are the place where the consumer and the farmer meet directly and where the consumer's money meets the farmer's hands directly. And that's really important because in this world of global economy, I like to describe it as this. If you can imagine yourself buying some strawberries in June from Bernie and Sandy Ware, who I see here, um, giving them 10 bucks for some strawberries and you hand them a $10 bill, you hand them 10 $1 bills, let's say, you know that those 10 $1 bills will stay first in Benzie County and then they'll start to pay their expenses and they'll pay them slowly locally. Now imagine, if you will, you're flying in one of those planes that are 30,000 feet above the air, and you can see Bernie and Sandy's farm down below you, and you take those 10 $1 bills and you throw them out the plane. That is how I express people going to the grocery store and buying a mystery box of groceries. Because the people in the community where you live get almost none of that money in the end. Because the money goes, to South America, or the money goes to the freighter ship that those things shipped on, or the containers of the truck drivers, or California, or Chile. So it's really important, farmers markets play a huge role in keeping your money local. And I can't tell you how important that is. There's a, a, an economic factor called the local multiplier effect, which says that every dollar you spend locally through a local um, business who actually created the product, whether that's grown or made there, that money stays in the community three to seven times longer than it would if you bought it from somewhere else. If you bought it from a retailer that bought their stuff from somewhere else, or certainly if you buy it online, and online's the big challenge right now. There are people shipping food. Amazon just bought Whole Foods, yeah. and that is going to change the shape of how food is uh, grown and made and sold in the country, so we're a little afraid of that. Farmers markets play a huge role and you should go to them as much as possible. Yeah. Well, I try not to be an absolutist. I, I catch myself when I say never, ask my wife, you never do the dishes or you never do this, right? Well, not always, never. Well, it's the same with, say, Amazon. I love Amazon. I just click, click and it, and it shows up. And so f for everybody in the, in the audience and everybody out home, back home, understand that we're not saying these are the bad guys these are the good guys what we're saying is take a look at your food and how much of that is coming from the neighbors or how much of it is coming from the farmers market how, how many places can you say how many things on your plate can you say oh I know what farm that came from whether it's the chicken or the you know the meat or the, or the vegetables that's the challenge it's not it's not don't ever go shopping you know, at Amazon or, or a big store again. Just try to recognize every time that you eat what you're, what you're eating. And the thing I like about having Lisa on the team as our market manager is she has a relationship with every one of our, of our vendors, every one of the farmers. She knows when, you know, what they're bringing this week. She knows who's here and what time they're gonna show up. And when I have meetings with Lisa, she says her, her objective is to help that farmer sell more produce and be better at their own business. So Lisa, with you, with that in mind, knowing that this is a local farmer's market, what other goals or what other ways do you think that we can uh, make, uh, make the awareness in the community greater for local foods besides a farmer's market? I know obviously the, a TV show is one way, but yeah. uh, you know, you build, you have a tiny home business, you, you really connect with the community. What are other ways you think that we can influence people's decision making when it comes to local food? I think that having like this what we're doing right now, talking to people and then encouraging folks to go and, and talk to another friend or tell the story of their food. So I know growing up, my mom wasn't really into buying local food or fair trade or organic or any of these sort of specialty things. And 
as they moved up north here, it became more part of the culture, and their friends were going to the farmer's market. Well, if their friends were going, they needed to go too. And now I go to my mom's house, and she'll tell me, oh, we got this at, from the garden, and we got this at the farmer's market, and she's so proud. And so I think part of it is sort of us shifting, kind of being open to adding a new dimension to kind of who we are and our health and our own well-being and being willing and confident to share that love and that inspiration with our community and with each other and so I encourage everybody here to do that certainly the farmers markets are great but you could consider you know going home and have a dinner with your friends that was all stuff you got at the farmers market and don't be afraid to tell them that and that's fun you know or maybe when you go on a trip you'd look for a place that has a you know has a farm or you go to visit um, an agritourism destination and support those farmers directly and that is another really fun way to do it so. Thank you. So today is a big day because we're going to show you how to do that. We've got uh, chef demonstrations. They shop from these vendors here at the farmer's market. They're going to show you how to use basil for caprese salad or making pesto. We've got uh, Chef Josh going to show us how to make kebabs. Uh, we've got my mom with my Aunt Barb, with my Aunt, Lisa, Aunt uh, Lexi, and my Aunt Rita in the kitchen right now canning <laughs> tomatoes. She's been in there since noon. I think, I think the... Uh, the apron she has from my great grandma. So this is old school canning tomatoes. We're gonna go see what they're up to in the kitchen. And uh, we got some fun stuff we're doing with Amalia Explorers and uh, a, lot of, a lot of great stuff today. We're, coming up, we're gonna have Seth Bernard play some music for us too, so stay tuned. Welcome to the kitchen here at Grow Benzi. We're in the little kitchen in the studio house. This is uh, where we hold a lot of kind of uh, specialized workshops like sauerkraut making. And right now we're canning tomatoes. And our very special guest is my mom, better known as Ma or Aunt Sugar or Aunt Chris um, or, Grammy. or Grammy and my sister Randy. So we got a couple generations here of tomato canning. And the idea that I wanted to convey today is you can preserve food. You can buy it here at the farmer's market, but you can preserve it so we can eat it all through the winter time. And I remember growing up, Ma used to make us go out and pick all the tomatoes and then have to do this. This was a chore back 30 years ago, but today it feels pretty good to have her doing all the work in the kitchen. Ma, what is it you're, you're, uh, you're having Randy do? Looks like you've been boiling. I think it's five hours that you're going on. Yes, I've been working in five hours. Each, each process is a little bit different. Right now I'm filling the hot tomatoes into the jar and she's putting in the um, citric acid and the salt and capping them and then they're gonna pop. So she, so she bought tomatoes from Marvin's Gardens and these are tomatoes also from Pam here at the farmer's market. And you boil down, you boil down the tomatoes, you skin them. I blanch right? the tomatoes, I blanch the tomatoes and then we skin them, and then I put them in the pot like this, and added peppers and onions, and brought them to a boil, and I boil them for probably 10 or 15 minutes, get them really, really hot. And then they go into hot jars, and my lids are hot, and from there, after it goes into a hot jar, I bring them out and put the salt and the citric acid in it. Randy Lynn's capping them, and then we always turn them upside down for about three seconds. I don't know why, it's just something that I've always done. So I've taught her to do it. Oh, I heard one pop. Yep, they're popping. So the great thing today is I have my Aunt Rita, my Aunt Barb, and my Aunt Lex in the studio audience here. And they've all been, they've been canning tomatoes. Well, Aunt Barb doesn't so much. She says she's not so much into them, but Aunt Lex and Aunt Rita have been cooking these tomatoes at this same recipe maybe since you were a girl? Just about like this, yep. Just about like this. And so they're not on the camera, but maybe we can get a shot of them to, uh, to say hi. So it's really a family, it was a family thing. It's a family tradition. And I think that's the case for a lot of uh, food preserving here in Benzie County, Northern Michigan, actually everywhere. You know, we, we have all this food that's fresh, but we harvest it. We want to preserve it, put it in the root cellar. We freeze it. Here at Grow Benzie, we do food dehydrating, food uh, freezing classes, and here's a canning, a canning class. So Ma's going to wrap this up, and as the bonus, we gave her all these jars. So if you donated jars, you helped Ma with, uh, with this workshop today. 
Um, because all of my jars goes to the kids' homes. Most of the time they bring them back because they want them refilled, but sometimes you don't get them back and I have to replenish. Right? And, but it's free refills. And everything I send to Montana, they bring their jars back also. Whether it's salsa, tomatoes, jams, fruits, anything that I can and people take, <laughs> it comes back and everybody enjoys it. And I enjoy doing it for them. So, so this, is, this has been food canning in the kitchen. I want to thank Randy and Ma for helping, helping out today. And if you have any questions about the other classes that we offer here at Grow Benzi, you can go to our website, growbenzi.org, or our face, Facebook page. Everybody, we're in Grow Benzie's amazing commercial kitchen where you too can come here and ply your own culinary trade if you'd like to. But right now I'm looking at some amazing food. It's got that green and red and white color and everybody knows this dish because you've seen it in every restaurant you've ever been to. And I'm with Steve and Pam and I'm gonna ask Steve, introduce yourself and tell us what this dish is. Well, I'm Steve Tebow. This is the classic Italian caprese salad. And uh, a little known fact is the caprese uh, was designed to kind of represent the flags of it, or the colors of the flags of Italy, uh, red, green, and white. And so the classic salad has just those elements with a little bit of salt on the tomatoes and typically just a little splash of olive oil. We're gonna drizzle a little bit of that over here. And that would be your classic Italian caprese. Uh, we often will uh, dress it up a little bit uh, with a, a balsamic reduction, which is uh, just taking balsamic vinegar and reducing it down to a syrup. It gives a nice sweet flavor to that. And I think it's important to note that at least for me, this salad is really only relevant about this time of year because we really, this is a salad that just highlights the tomato. And at this time of year, we get the greatest tomatoes and some of the best tomatoes that I can think of come from Grow Benzi's uh, greenhouses and Pam, uh, who is the farmer there. These are all grown here in uh, greenhouses. Um, they're pruned really well, they're fed really well um, and trellised, they're gorgeous. Heirlooms that, that is uh, Grow Benzi, um, they're, Grow Benzi's known for their beautiful heirloom tomatoes. And I have to concur with Steve, this is the time to eat them all by themselves. They're amazing. Something like this just um, showcases all these great flavors. And it is the Italian flag, clearly, but we've had, we have some beautiful yellow heirlooms and these green um, zebra heirlooms also just make like a beautiful salad and you and these plated like this is gorgeous but you could even do this in a spread on a platter and pam's basil and and the basil is grown here too grow Benzie. pam pick up one of those heirloom tomatoes and tell us what makes an heirloom tomato different than other tomatoes you see in the market um mostly the see the fact that the seeds are saved and passed down hence heirloom um, almost all of the tomatoes grown here at Grobenzi are heirlooms. I know that this is a Mortgage Lifter, which is one of my favorites. Um, I believe that is sort of a beef steak, and I know this is just a, what they call like an Americana slicer, Amer American slicer. Um, and, and we have all of those seeds here. We have a seed bank. We have a lot of heirloom um, seeds saved over years and years. I mean, tomato seeds will last through the, you know, through Armageddon, you know, I mean, they're, they're here forever. And uh, that's great because they, it's, it's nice to pass all these local tomatoes down and, and here, right here in Michigan, year after year. And, and for me, they just seem to taste better. I was gonna say, better. Well, we'll talk about that. What, yeah. what, what makes them taste better, Steve? I don't know, that's up to, <laughs> you know, that, somehow Pam makes them taste Sunshine. better. Than, yeah, I'm assuming that it, and Pam would have to verify this, but the, the consistency and the saving of the seeds from year to year as opposed to, you know, I buy tomatoes all year round, but I don't really buy tomatoes to eat like an apple or to eat on a caprese, except for right around this time of year. 
I would never serve this in our restaurant uh, as a salad except for in about a four or five week sure. window because this tomato just pops. I had one of these with Pam right before we started and I can't wait to share it with you. These are amazing. A little bit of salt, a little a bit little of pepper, bit of and that's all you need. You can take need. away everything else and just add the salts and you would have a beautiful meal right, yeah, right. right there. Well, look at this, a Gro Benzi Caprese salad, a gorgeous thing to look at. And as soon as we sign off here, we're gonna eat those things. So thanks a lot for tuning in. So I'm here with Kevin Thomas of Paul Oliver. He's a dietitian, and he is the site coordinator for the Fruit and Vegetable Prescription Program. So what exactly is a fruit and vegetable prescription? So the fruit and vegetable prescription is actually brought to us by the Rotary Charities of Grand Travers. They don donated all the funds, and Paul Oliver is one of four key locations in which we basically make referrals if certain uh, patients or certain members of the community meet criteria. Criteria is, one, uh, the person must live in Benzie County. And secondly, they must have a chronic condition. So uh, we're trying to help people from a physical standpoint that need some help. It's not based on what one's income is, but it's based on their physical need which I think is fantastic. So each person that is eligible, and this year we had up to 125, can receive $100 in coupons, redeemable only here uh, Monday afternoon at Grow Benzie. It's only on fresh fruit, fresh vegetables, seedlings, herbs, and mushrooms. It's not good on the baked goods, which are over there, which are fine for some. Uh, we've had more than a few people ask me if we can get those. No, it's not open to that. So, but our goal was 125 people as the number that we wanted to open it up to. That's uh, the available funds for 125 people. I think we've done a fantastic job. The data up to this point shows if said person out of the 125 shows up, it's about 85% certainty they're going to come to all four cooking demonstrations so they can get their $100 in redeemable coupons, which is, which is awesome. If they come once, they're going to come twice, or in Grant's case, the fourth time today. Awesome. So what are you seeing in terms of um, results or feedback or what are people saying? Like, do they like the program? What are they? Sure. sure. The, uh, the feedback that I've received thus far has been very positive. Uh, anytime one is trying to change a behavior, there's many different tenants that kind of fall in line that points towards success. Uh, I call it shaping the path. So if you give somebody the education, that's great but education without the means does nothing. Okay, so we offer the education through the cooking demonstrations. Not only that, we offer the means. We offer the fruits and vegetables. And in addition to that, you're around other peers who want to eat healthier. It's fantastic for change. Uh, and I think, I mean, what people have told me, it's, it's been a very positive impact on the community, positive impact on the people that actually tend the, the fruits and vegetable prescription, which at one point, we had a class outdoors that was 45 people. That's the most we've had any one wow. time. Yeah. That's so great. For Benzie County, I think that's pretty big numbers, right? Yeah, that's wonderful. And I know from the farmer's point of view, folks have been really happy because it's an additional source of income for them, which makes the market more viable and it makes their livelihood as farmers and producers in our community more viable. So it's, it's a great win to see also new faces at the farmer's market who maybe aren't folks that come every single week or every season who maybe now next year will come. So that's a, a, another win. And I'm also glad that I was uh, asked to come out on Monday evenings this summer because honestly, as a dietitian, I live in Travers, I had never stopped. I feel bad now saying that, even though I'm kind of admitting it, but I had never once stopped and I'm kind of happy to find out this is what's in the community. These are the people, um, as Josh was uh, uh, stating a few moments ago, they want to see the community a better place, keeping the money in house. Uh, it's a foreign concept to a lot of people, but small communities, it's kind of a core concept. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, it's been great to, to have you here, and um, 
This fruit and vegetable pres prescription program is something we're just really excited as part of the programs here at Grow Benzi this year and look forward to continuing to work on this, the goals that the program represents. And uh, a special thanks goes out to a few different people who volunteered their time to cook. I'm a dietitian. I do a lot of talking here at uh, the Fruits and Vegetables Prescription. Those people, those guys that have helped out, we had Josh Barnes, correct? Jim, Jim, Barnes. Jim Barnes. Excuse me. Jim Barnes helped out along with Josh Stoltz. And uh, Josh Heron in the back, wherever he's at, he's done, uh, he kind of jumped in the last month and a half. And one thing that he preaches every week, simplicity wins out. If one's trying to eat healthier, there's many ways to do it. And oftentimes we can get lost in the complexity. Josh's recipes typically have five or less ingredients. That's awesome. And I don't want to forget a uh, shout out also to Hayden, our food truck manager, who jumped in as a guest chef one day when the chef couldn't be here. So we've, we've had a great team making it happen every week, regardless of the circumstances. So it's been, been a lot of fun. Welcome out here to the Eagle's Nest. This is a black locust gazebo, and this is the starting point for a new edible trail system at Grobenzi. You can see Bayside Printing did a great job of outlining where the trail is, and we also have handouts and maps, so when you stop by Grobenzi, you'll be able to follow this and stop at all these learning stations along the way. I'm gonna show you a couple today, so follow me. This was afforded through a grant from the Traverse City Rotary Charities and the Health Department of Northwest Michigan. They believe, like we do, that the adding education with, uh, with, with food is a good thing. So here's one of the stops. These are our bee boxes. These bee boxes we make in our after school program at Benzie Center. We call it Hive Minded. We had students from Bear Lake last year, Frankfurt, Alberta area schools, and of course Benzie Central. We made these bee boxes from raw materials donated from uh, Honor Building Supply. And uh, these bees are actually kept from a, a group of people calling, calling themselves the Benzie Area Beekeepers Guild. Well, we all call them that, but the idea is this community kind of center uh, can show people how bees help us in the area, and then we use the, the honey that we spin out of here as a fundraiser to help perpetuate the program at the school and then the Benzie Area Beekeepers Guild. So pretty soon we're gonna have a sign that says, bees are great, we make these bee boxes in our after school program, and we have a beekeepers guild. So this is a neat part of the edible trail system. Check this out though. This is our new mini golf. It's an edible mini golf. So when you come down here and you wanna putt, I think we've got six holes now. You can eat some strawberries along the way, maybe some blueberries. We have all sorts of the putters right here. We have our new uh, golf balls. We even have some, uh, some, some logoed Grow Benzie golf balls. Just another fun thing that you can do when you rent the event center for your wedding or for any, uh, any parties you wanna have. Let's go down here to the studio downstairs. We've got uh, Amalia. Amalia has a leather working workshop that she's wrapping up here. Amalia, what are you doing today? Well, we're making our own bracelets out of repurposed leather from my dad's shoe business. And what these guys are working on is tooling the leather here, which is an ancient leather crafting tradition. Very cool, just a, just a fun activity that we've offered here at the Girl Benzie Farmer's Market. But follow me in here. This is our sewing studio in the downstairs office of Girl Benzie. I'm here with Kathy Ross. She's the team leader for the area chapter of Days for Girls. Now, what can you tell me about Days for Girls in the last, well, since last October you started, what is it you've been up to in here, Kathy? <laughs> Well, our Benzie chapter of Days for Girls began, as you said, in last October. We're part of the international uh, nonprofit Days for Girls. And what we do is we make these uh, washable menstrual kits, and we ship them worldwide to girls who have no, uh, no access to uh, the kinds of things that they need to manage their periods. So, so far, we've sent out 650 kits. It's amazing. And they just sent... 240 to Haiti and actually had some of the folks that worked on it go to Haiti. That's right, and they just got back and were telling us all their experiences today. Pretty neat, so this sewing studio is just one of the, one of the activities that's, that's fiber related. I'm gonna show you the fiber shed where we collect fiber that helps support entrepreneurship and uh, programs like this, follow me. On the way, I want you to look over here my shoulder. To the right, these are the greenhouses that we grow food in. So we have an incubator farmer who's been growing food for restaurants, resorts, our farmer's market, a food truck, 
15,000 square feet of growing space uh, she's been working on this summer. But out behind that greenhouse is where the edible trail goes. We've got daylilies growing. 120 plants were donated from dye out at the Betsy River Centennial Lily Farm. Those are edible, so next season I hope you stop by and try some of the lilies. We have a compost a station, we've got mushroom logs, we have rain barrels, all sorts of spots along the trail that you can learn about when you visit this, uh, the edible trail system. This is the last thing I want to show you out here behind Grow Benzie's big event center. This is called My Fiber Shed. Emily is a volunteer who's, who came in. She wanted to start this fiber shed to divert fabric and fiber from the landfill and she puts it into these, uh, these other uh, programs like Days for Girls. Uh, she has a guy who makes uh, rag rugs. She's got some other projects like selling on Etsy that helps fund, fund this program but also gives an opportunity for folks to come in and learn about different fibers. You can see she's got some cattails here. She's got some milkweed that she's been carting out. This used to be used in uh, life preservers back in World War II, it's, it floats. So pretty neat stuff. People can come here, learn about fiber, donate, earn fiber credits back to purchase things for their own projects. So lots of cool things happen out behind Grow Benzie's Event Center. We hope you stop by out, out back sometime. Welcome to Nature Explorers. At Nature Explorers, we have some program animals that we learn about and get to interact with. This is Scaly and Slimy. This is Scaly, he's an eastern corn snake. This is Slimy, he is a tiger salamander. Scaly, and, Scaly is a reptile and Slimy is an amphibian, so they learn about the differences between that. We also take nature walks out in the garden and look for different animals. We play games and we make art projects. So we're going to look around the garden a little bit right now and let's see what you guys can find. See if you can find something to pick. I found this, it was laying on the ground. And what is that? A, ch a husk cherry. And can you show us how to open it? Sorry, I already opened it. That's okay. And Vivian, what did you find? A bean. A green bean? What did you find, Jameson? A tomato. <laughs> okay, can you guys find some tomatoes? How can you tell when the tomatoes are ready? Red. When they're red. Okay, do you want to taste your tomato? Okay. Okay. Oh, look around over there. Look, I see some red ones. And this garden was planted completely by the children. So the summer camp kids planted this garden all by themselves. They can come here at any time and harvest it. The fall classes will help to harvest the garden and the children will take the stuff home from it. So thank you for joining us for Nature Explorers today. Nature Explorers! So I'm here now with Jim Barnes, again in the incubator kitchen here at Grow Benzi. Jim Barnes is the chef at uh, Alberto's Taqueria and also the Crystal Lake Catering. And we're here to highlight one, another vegetable that is in season right now that just comes on in abundance and some people just don't know what to do with it all. And we're here to talk about the awesome food called pesto. My actual um, ex-boyfriend, I used to always say, pesto is the besto, and I believe that. I agree. Um, so I guess I'm here to demonstrate how to make pesto. And uh, so I have elected to work with Grow Benzi Fresh Basil and um, some Grow Benzi Fresh Parsley, and we're gonna, do about a three part basil to one part parsley um, ratio and um, pop it into a Cuisinart and then turn it into either a paste or a dressing or a sauce or there, it can be utilized in so many different ways as uh, Lisa just described. So, but we'll start it as a paste and then we can add oil and make it a dressing and a marinade and or we could add cream and make it a, a cream sauce or we could blend it into mayonnaise and make it a, 
a spread for a sandwich. It's really versatile and just freshens and lightens and makes everything so summer-like special. Perfect, let's do it. Yeah, hey, before we do anything though, let's drop our, um, our, um, what are we, what are we gonna drop? We're gonna drop our um, cheese ravioli into the water and then we'll make the pesto. Okay, so Jim's grabbing the cheese ravioli out of the fridge. So this is going to be a vehicle to eat the pesto with. So you've got some homemade no, oh, it's not homemade. It's I, not homemade. I would never make it. <laughs> but uh, I, I can drop it into water and boil it pretty easily. And I'm going to do that right now. Okay. That sounds great. So basil, you know, it grows here in the Gros Benzi hoop houses. It really likes it when it's hot. <clears throat> and I believe this is the same type of pesto that was used in the caprese salad. Yes. Genovese. It was, yeah. And it's also actually known to be um, good for your mood. So it's partly why I think those of us that like basil, it's like you smell it and it actually can have good properties for you. So let's see, what are you, what are you doing here now? You're I just added uh, one part parsley to two parts basil. And I'm gonna add a third part of basil. And then I'm gonna, um, and it's gonna be heaping and overflowing, and it's gonna seem like it's unmanageable, but what, as soon as I drop a little oil into it, and then um, hit it with the Cuisinart, it's gonna drop down to hardly anything. It's gonna, it's gonna reduce to a point of, it's gonna have a lot less stature. Okay, so I gotta add a little bit of oil so that it can get some traction, and then, and I want to make sure I don't add too much oil so that I can keep it as a paste if I feel the need to. All right, so now that I've got it down in a manageable position, I'm going to take uh, three quarters of a cup of walnuts. Now, just keep in mind that typically a fresh basil pesto would be made with pine nuts. And my buddy Steve told me that he bought five pounds of pine nuts for $105 wholesale. So I've decided to replace my pine nut with the walnut. It costs a lot less and it really still gives it great flavor and all the, the texture that you would probably get from a pine nut. Um, and then the other thing I'm gonna add is Parmesan cheese. But I'm gonna go a little light on Parmesan because if we're highlighting if we're working with other cheeses such as mozzarella and things of that nature, uh, the Parmesan can be a little bit um, compete with other cheeses. So I'm gonna go light on the Parmesan cheese and uh, so then it can be, be compatible with other cheeses if I choose to use it later in the afternoon. So I would normally go about a full cup of Parmesan, but I'm just gonna use half a cup of Parmesan. And then I'm gonna drop a teaspoon of of uh, salt in there because everybody needs a little salt and pepper in their dish to balance it out and orient themselves and feel at home and comfortable. If you don't have any salt and pepper in your meal, you don't feel, you feel a little disoriented, I believe. And then I'm gonna go one uh, heaping spoon of minced garlic. And garlic's another thing that's in season right now, and luckily that stays in season for a long time yeah. once it's dried and cured, so that's great. So I'm gonna add a little bit more oil now to uh, enable it to puree itself nicely, and I'm gonna, um, but make sure I haven't put too much oil into it so that it will remain a paste, and then eventually it can be turned into a marinade, or a dressing, or a sauce. That's great, and I learned, and you could tell me if it's what you know too, Jim, that a pesto is, is, a, is a word for any type of uh, sort of paste like this with, a, with a, say, a nut and an herb. So there's other, you could, so let's say, make a cilantro um, pesto following a similar procedure if it was earlier in the season you had cilantro instead of basil. Yeah, that very well could be the case. I've always known that I've, when I've heard people say pestos, and there's so many different pestos on the market that I felt like, hey, more than likely there's a nut and there maybe even uh, some garlic and then a, fre a primary herb. I nice. think that would represent, and maybe, maybe cheese, I'm not sure. I, like I've had other pestos that I've made personally that didn't have cheese, so. Wonderful. 
So I'm, um, I think we're getting to a nice little pace and this, that texture you can see right there if you wanted to blend it with mayonnaise and spread it over your sandwich to make a, a veggie sandwich or this paste could also be thinned down with things like uh, cream and turned into a nice pasta sauce. Um, we don't have any cream, but we do have pasta. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna go ahead and thin it down a little bit more with oil and then it could be turned into a great dressing or a marinade. And it could also just be a great sauce for the pasta. Wonderful, and one of the things that my dad does is he puts it in ice cube trays and then freezes that to use as individual servings for later in the year. So we're just about to wrap up here. So this looks wonderful, Jim. So this is what you, basically you've got now, the base for all sorts of good things with yeah. sandwiches and other things, taking advantage of a great ingredient. So thank you, Chef Jim, and uh, well, thank you all for tuning in. You're welcome. Thank you, Lisa. Hey everyone, we're down here in the Grow Benzi hoop houses. These used to be greenhouses, but now we do not heat them. Uh, we're growing directly out of the soil, and I wanted to escape, bring Chad down here for a quick one-on-one. -on -one. Chad is the owner-operator of uh, Coal Creek Permaculture. He has a booth here at our farm, uh, farmer's market on Mondays. And uh, this venture started a few years ago. Chad, why don't you tell us about your crew? Sure. Uh in 2014, I was on a, a land search. I had spent five years searching for just the right piece of land for a permaculture farm. I had a lot of boxes that needed to be ticked on that piece of land, and uh, after five years, I found a beautiful piece of land, 35 acres in Benzonia, right on Ballard Road, and uh, we started uh, started right away going to work, uh, building the farm, building the system. The first uh, year we built the barn, second year we built the greenhouse, and the third season we started uh, some of our growing infrastructure, like a 210-foot hugel culture mound on contour all the way across the land. We've got uh, 250 golden delicious apple trees on property. We're really trying to perennialize the system, get more perennial stuff in there, but we also do all of our popular annual vegetables for marketing. Um, it's me and three friends that I grew up with. Um, I talked them into uh, giving me a little sweat equity because I couldn't do it all myself. It's a lot of work. As you know, a farm is a lot of work. So uh, I offered them a little a little ownership in the company in exchange for some, for some sweat. And it's, so far, it's, it's worked wonderfully. It's been great. We're having a good time with it. And uh, things are getting better every season. It seems like it. Your, your crew shows up with smiles every week. Yeah, uh, we we're having a lot of fun with it. Everybody, uh, everybody loves to pitch in. Everybody has the things they enjoy doing a little more than others. You know, I'm, I'm a, I like to have my hands in the dirt. I got a partner, Dan, who's the mechanic. You know, so if it's a combustible engine and something goes wrong, we give it to Dan. So everybody's kind of got their their specialty niches, and then I just kind of am the great puppet master that makes sure everything happens when it should and as it should. Very good. Well, what's different about uh, Pam and farming here in our in our hoop houses, uh, these guys specialize in permaculture, so they're checking out the land economics versus just having straight up rows in this covered structure. What sort of, I know you grow hops as well, what sort of relationships are you growing together to, uh, to maximize your crops? Um, well, there's, you can grow up to seven different things in one footprint. So if you walk into the forest, you're going to see seven different layers of growth. You'll have your canopy tree and your understory and your shrub layer and you'll have your ground cover layer and then you'll have your root or rhizome layer and then you have your, your vertical climbing layer. So you could, for example, everybody, a lot of people are familiar with the Three Sisters Guild, corn and the squash and the beans. Uh, so they all occupy a different level or, or niche in, in, the, in those seven layers. So the, they grow cooperatively instead of competitively. The corn is behind and it's, a, it's taller and then a, a climber could climb the corn stalk. You could plant a pole bean to climb the corn stalk and you could plant strawberries as a ground cover and they're gonna be down here and they're not gonna use the same nutrients and their roots are not gonna be at the same space in the soil. And so, by polyculturing, which is planting more than one thing in one spot, um, then you get a lot of benefits by doing that. You get, uh, you know, 
pathogens don't spread that way because if, if a pest for one plant lands on the on the one on the plant and it looks around and it finds different plants it won't spread it'll just die right. off and be isolated there okay so we try to get plants that help each other instead of compete with each other i like it yeah well it's, it's great having you here at the at the farmer's market we hope to see you again next year thank you and you will yeah absolutely if you can find them online but uh hopefully you'll see them next next summer here at the grow benzie farmer's market Thanks, thank Jeff. you thank you josh so i met seth about 10 years ago my dad took me to see him at the mackinac brewing company in Traverse City he said this is the guy that you want to watch and so about a month ago I was talking to Lisa about music about local music about music what kind of music she listens to and I started telling her about um, Seth Bernard and the Earth Earthwork Music Collective now Seth has been a leader in Michigan music now for well over that decade since I first saw him but uh, Seth, besides being being vocal in terms of local musicians and trying to get local music out in the scene, he's also active in bringing a voice uh, for locals in a national uh, venue. And so he's been a speaker at South by Southwest conference down in Texas, in Austin recently. Uh, he was a recent speaker for TEDx. He's he's uh, just he's activated. Would be the word that I'd I'd use. And uh, he's going to share a little. He's going to share some songs with us today. But knowing Seth over the last 10 years and seeing how we've grown together in this community makes me real proud that he's here with us today. But for him to speak his voice through his songs uh, just takes it to the next level. I was a classic rock guy. Turn on the 98.1 or 97.5 KLT, and that was it, right? And so to get connected into local music that was that really spoke to my heart and was still rock and roll was the next level for me. Now, I know you grew up on KLT also. You're, you're from Lake City. That's right. Double rock KLT. And the bear. And the bear. Well, rock and roll is so important. It's, it's all about liberation, you know, and we need collective liberation more than ever in the, these United States. What you guys got going on here is just wonderful. It's multi-generational. It's vibrant. People are happy. People are connecting with each other. The kids are playing. Um, very, very colorful. So, and you know, not only are farmers markets the, the fastest growing sector of the food system in our country, what you have here is like education built into it and you know, a little bit of comedy, a little bit of creativity. It's artful, it's engaging. Uh, very hard to find anything negative about it. It's just a win, win, win situation. So I'm honored to be here. Thanks to everybody in the live studio audience too. So we were discussing if we should have him do a cover song or an original song, and I, and I asked him to play one of my favorite songs because it's, it hits close to home, and I hope some of you that have never heard Seth before might check out his music at home or anybody that's listening out there, but I'm hoping you can play that tune we talked about. All right, this one's called This Here. It's kind of about uh, our responsibility that we're born into as humans. Um, I got to meet one of my heroes, Richie Havens, years ago, and he broke that word down for me as a singer-songwriter and a performing artist. He said, you have a responsibility and you have to be able to respond. So your responsibility is your ability to respond to the times that you live in. I was thinking about that when I wrote this song. This one's for you, Josh. Thanks for the awesome work that you're doing and the smiles you bring to everybody. We're never gonna get away with this We're taking this with us when we go We're never gonna get away Without this here us We're never gonna get another chance We're leaving this with us when we go we're never gonna get away without this here us we're steered by the fear we're here this with us when we're clear we're never gonna reappear like this here us it's enough it's more than enough, it's more than more, it's never 
never gonna be too little, too late to be this here. Thank you. Thanks a lot, everybody. I know you've caught a few drizzles, which have been great for the plants, a little drink for the, for the gardens. But this is Turkeys in the Rain, and I'm going to need you guys to back me up, especially you guys. We're going to go like this. Turkeys in the rain. That last one, I need everybody at home on that last one too. Turkeys in the rain. Turkeys in the rain. Turkeys in the rain. All right, here we go. Turkeys in the rain and they don't complain. They just graze in the field with the cattle in the mist. And they don't miss out on the life feed. They got what they need. Flock rocks the farm and they move across land. Walk across roads by the charms of the divas and leave us with scat and feathers and feelings and the oats and our cats. They love us from the other, other side of the pain. Turkeys in the rain. Turkeys in the rain. Turkeys in the rain. Turkeys in the rain. Yeah. 
Turkeys in the rain. Turkeys in the rain and they don't complain They just roll with the posse in the shadow of the herd The crows fly by out the corner of the eye The big banks fall at the cradle of the market The tower of Babel ever since the agricultural revolution We've been fussing and fighting But now we're inciting and fighting inheritance The spark of love Mighty, mighty light that's free offline It's the cure for pain Turkeys in the rain. Turkeys in the rain. Turkeys in the rain is the game refrain Like Abel and Cain, the third son remains Like Egypt in the spring and the all-seeing eye The class culture of castes and tribes And the hierarchy creatures in the field The blueprint yield my draft for a force field Shield for to stay sane, get tame Remain in the web and the chain of the mainframe Turkeys in the rain Turkeys in the rain. Turkeys in the rain. Turkeys in the rain. All right, last one, everybody. Turkeys in the rain. Turkeys in the rain. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time.